12. Secret Societies in England. We have seen that from the Illuminati onwards subversive societies have always sought recruits amongst Orthodox Freemasons. The reason for this is obvious, not only do the doctrines of Freemasonry lend themselves to perversion, but the training provided in the lodges makes an admirable preparation for initiation into other secret systems. The man who has learnt to maintain silence even on what may appear to him as trivialities, who is willing to submit to mystification, to ask no questions, and to recognize the authority of superiors whom he is in no way legally obliged to obey, who has, moreover, become imbued with the esprit de corps which binds him to his fellow members in a common cause, is naturally a better subject for the secret society adept than the freelance who is liable to assert his independence at any moment. Perhaps the most important factor, however, is the nature of the Masonic Oaths. These terrible penalties, which many Freemasons themselves regret as a survival of barbarism and which have in fact been abolished in the higher degrees, have done much to create prejudice against Freemasonry, whilst at the same time they provide an additional incentive to outside intriguers. In the opinion of M. Copin Albansley, the abolition of the oath would go far to prevent penetration of British Masonry by the secret societies. Now, by their obligations British Freemasons are forbidden to join these irregular societies, not only because their principles are in conflict with those of Orthodox Masonry, but because in most cases they admit women. According to the ruling of Grand Lodge, any member working under the English jurisdiction violates his obligation by being present at or assisting in assemblies professing to be Masonic which are attended by women. Warnings to this effect have been frequently given in the lodges. On September 3, 1919, the Board of General Purposes issued the following report. The Board's attention is being increasingly drawn to sedulous endeavors which are being made by certain bodies unrecognized as Masonic by the United Grand Lodge of England, to induce Freemasons to join in their assemblies. As all such bodies which admit women to membership are clandestine and irregular, it is necessary to caution brethren against being inadvertently led to violate their obligation by becoming members of them or attending their meetings. Grand Lodge, nine years since, approved the action of the board in suspending from all Masonic rights and privileges to brethren who had contumaciously failed to explain the grave Masonic irregularity to which attention is now again called and it is earnestly hoped that no occasion will arise for having again to institute disciplinary proceedings of a like kind. The idea of women masons is, of course, not a new one. As early as 1730 lodges for women are said to have existed in France, and towards the end of the century several excellent women, such as the Duchess de Bourbon and the Princess de Lamballe, played a leading part in the order. But this ma honored adoption, as it was called, retained a purely convivial character, a sham ceremonial, with symbols, passwords, and a ritual, was devised as a consolation to the members for their exclusion from the real lodges. These mummeries were, as Regan observes, only the pretexts for assemblies, the real objects were the banquet and the ball, which were their inevitable accompaniments. But this precedent, inaugurated as a society pastime and accompanied by all the frivolity of the age, paved the way for Weishaupt's two classes of women members, who, although never initiated into the secrets of the order, were to act as useful tools, directed by men without knowing it. For this purpose they were to be divided into two classes, the virtuous to play the part of figureheads or decoys, and the freer-hearted, who were to carry out the real designs of the order, the same plan was adopted nearly a hundred years later by Weishaupt's disciple Bakunin, who, however, did admit women as actual initiates into his secret society, the Alliance Sociale Democratique, but, like Weishaupt, divided them into classes. The sixth category of people to be employed in the work of social revolution is thus described in his program. The sixth category is very important. They are the women who must be divided into three classes, the first, frivolous women, without mind or heart, which we must use in the same manner as the third and fourth categories of men, 
that is by, getting hold of their dirty secrets and making them our slaves, comma, the second, the ardent, devoted and capable women, but who are not ours because they have not reached a practical revolutionary understanding, without phrase we must make use of these like the men of the fifth category, that is by, drawing them incessantly into practical and perilous manifestations, which will result in making the majority of them disappear while making some of them genuine revolutionaries, comma, finally, the women who are entirely with us, that is to say completely initiated and having accepted our program in its entirety. We ought to consider them as the most precious of our treasures, without whose help we can do nothing. The first and only woman to be admitted into real masonry, if such a term can be applied to so heterogeneous a system, was Maria de Raismes, an ardent French feminist celebrated for her political speeches and electioneering campaigns in the district of Ponta Island for 25 years the acknowledged leader of the anti-clerical and feminist party. In 1882 Maria de Raismes was initiated into Freemasonry by the members of the Lodge Lailabas Pensers, deriving from the Grand Log symbolic cosses and situated at Beck in the department of saint The proceeding being, however, entirely unconstitutional, Maria de Raismes's initiation was declared by the Grand Log to be null and void and the Lodge Lailabas Pensers was disgraced. But some years afterwards Dr. George Martin, an enthusiastic advocate of votes for women, collaborated with Maria de Raismes in founding the Ma Honorary Mixed at the first lodge of the order named, Le Dois Humaine. The Super Me Conceal Universal Mixed was founded in 1899. The Ma Honorary Mixed was political and in no way theosophical or occult, and its program, like that of the Grand Orient, was utopian socialism whilst by its insistence on the supremacy of reason it definitely proclaimed its antagonism to all revealed religion. Thus in the involved language of Dr. George Martin himself. The Order Mar Onique Mixed International is the first mixed, philosophic, progressive, and philanthropic Masonic power to be organized and constituted in the world placed above all the preoccupations of the philosophical or religious ideas which may be professed by those who ask to become members. The order wishes to interest itself principally in the vital interests of the human being on earth, it wishes above all to study in its temples the means for realizing peace between all nations and social justice which will enable all human beings to enjoy during their lives the greatest possible sum of moral felicity and of material well-being claiming no divine revelation and loudly affirming that it is only an emanation of human reason, this fraternal institution is not dogmatic, it is rationalist. Into this materialist and political club, erected under the guise of Freemasonry, entered Annie Besant with all the strange conglomeration of Eastern doctrines now known as Theosophy. Theosophy. Before entering on this question it is necessary to make my own position clear. Although I should much prefer not to introduce a personal note into the discussion, I feel that nothing I say will carry any weight if it appears to be an expression of opinion by one who has never considered religious doctrines from anything but the orthodox Christian point of view. I should explain, then, that I have known theosophists from my early youth, that I have traveled in India, Ceylon, Burma, and Japan and seen much to admire in the great religions of the East. I do not believe that God has revealed himself to one portion of mankind alone and that during only the last 1900 years of the world's history, I do not accept the doctrine that all the millions of human beings who have never heard of Christ are plunged in spiritual darkness, I believe that behind all religions founded on a law of righteousness there lies a divine and central truth, that Icknaton, Moses and Isaiah, Socrates and Epictetus, Marcus Aurelius, Buddha, Zoroaster, and Muhammad were all teachers who interpreted to men the aspect of the divine as it had been vouchsafed to them and which in harmony with the supreme revelation given to man by Jesus Christ. This conception of an affinity between all great religious faiths was beautifully expressed by an old Mohammedan to a friend of the present writer with whom he stood watching a Hindu procession pass through an Indian village. In answer to the Englishman's inquiry, what do you think of this? The Mohammedan replied. 
Ah, Saib, we cannot tell. We know of three roads up the hill of endeavor to the gates of paradise the way of Msa, Moses, the way of Issa, Jesus, and the way of Mamoud, and there may be other roads of which you and I know nothing. I was born in the way of Mamoud, and I believe it to be the best and the easiest to follow, and you were born in the way of Issa. And of this I am very sure, that if you will follow your guide on your road and I follow my guide on my road, when we have climbed the hill of endeavor, we shall salute one another again at the gates of paradise. If, then, in the following pages I attempt to show the errors of theosophy, it is not because I do not recognize that there is much that is good and beautiful in the ancient religions from which it professes to derive. But what is theosophy? The word, as we have already seen, was used in the 18th century to denote the theory of the Martinists. It was known two centuries earlier when Hazelmeyer in 1612 wrote of, the laudable fraternity of the Theosophists of the Rosy Cross. According to Colonel Olcott, who with Madame Blavatsky founded the Modern Theosophical Society in New York in 1875, the word was discovered by one of the members, in turning over the leaves of a dictionary, and forthwith unanimously adopted. Madame Blavatsky had arrived in America two years earlier before which date she professed to have been initiated into certain esoteric doctrines in Tibet. Monsieur Gounon, who writes with inside knowledge of the movement, indicates, however, the existence of concealed superiors on the continent of Europe by whom she was in reality directed. What is very significant? Is that Madame Blavatsky in 1875 wrote this? I have been sent from Paris to America in order to verify phenomena and their reality and to show the deception of the spiritualist theory. Sent by whom? Later she will say, by the Mahatmas, but then there was no question of them, and besides it was in Paris that she received her mission, and not in India or in Tibet. Elsewhere Monsieur Gounon observes that it is very doubtful whether Madame Blavatsky was ever in Tibet at all. These obvious attempts at concealment lead Monsieur Gounon therefore to the conclusion that in the background of theosophy there existed a mysterious center of direction, that Madame Blavatsky was simply, an instrument in the hands of individuals or occult groups sheltering behind her personality, and that, those who believe she invented everything, that she did everything by herself and on her own initiative, are as much mistaken as those who, on the contrary, believe her affirmations concerning her relations with the pretended Mahatmas. There is some reason to believe that the people under whom Madame Blavatsky was working at this date in Paris were Serapis Bay and Tuity Bay, who belonged to, the Egyptian brothers. This might answer M. Gounon's question, by whom was she sent to America? But another passage from Madame Blavatsky's writings, on the person of Christ, that M. Gunon quotes later, indicates a further source of inspiration, for me, Jesus Christ, that is to say the man God of the Christians, copy of the avatars of all countries, of the Hindu Krishnas of the Egyptian Horus, was never a historical personage. Hence the story of his life was merely an allegory founded on the existence of, a personage named Jehoshua born at Lud. But elsewhere she asserted that Jesus may have lived during the Christian era or a century earlier, as the Sefer toldeth Jehoshua indicates, my italics. And Madame Blavatsky went on to say of the savants who deny the historical value of this legend, that they either lie or talk nonsense. It is our masters who affirm it, my italics. If the history of Jehoshua or Jesus ben Pandora is false, then the whole of the Talmud, the whole of the Jewish canon law, is false. It was the disciple of Jehoshua ben Baracha, the fifth president of the Sanhedrin since Ezra, who rewrote the Bible. This story is much truer than that of the New Testament, of which history does not say a word. Who were the masters whose authority Madame Blavatsky here invokes? Clearly not the Trans-Himalayan Brotherhood to whom she habitually refers by this term and who can certainly not be suspected of affirming the authenticity of the toldeth Yesu. It is evident, then, that there were other masters from whom Madame Blavatsky received this teaching, and that those other masters were Kabbalists. 
The same Judaic influence appears more strongly in a book published by the Theosophical Society in 1903, where the Talmud and the Tildot Yeshu are quoted at great length and the Christians are derided for resenting the attacks on their faith contained in these books, whilst the Jews are represented as innocent, persecuted victims. One passage will suffice to give an idea of the author's point of view. The Christ, said the mystics, was born of a virgin, the unwitting believer in Jesus as the historical Messiah in the exclusive Jewish sense, and in his being the Son of God, nay God himself, in course of time asserted that Mary was that virgin, whereupon rabbinical logic, which in this case was simple and common logic, met this extravagance by the natural retort that, seeing that his paternity was unacknowledged, Jesus was therefore illegitimate, a bastard, mamza. It is obviously, then, less from Tibetan Mahatmas, Hindu Swamis, Sikh Gurus, or Egyptian brothers than from Jewish Kabbalists that these leaders of Theosophy have borrowed their ideas on Jesus Christ. As the Jewish writer Adolf Frank has truly observed, D. S. Quillist questioned a Theosophy, on a S.A. devoir apparat la cabale and he goes on to show the direct influence of Kabbalism on the modern Theosophical Society. Mrs. Besant, without endorsing the worst blasphemies of the Tildot Yeshu, nevertheless reflected this and other Judaic traditions in her book Esoteric Christianity, where she related that Jesus was brought up amongst Theosans, and that later he went to Egypt, where he became an initiate of the Great Esoteric Lodge that is to say the Great White Lodge from which all great religions derive. It will be seen that this is only a version of the old story of the Talmudists and Kabbalists, perpetuated by the Gnostics, the Rosicrucians, and the 19th century Order du Temple. But according to one of Mrs. Besant's theosophical antagonists, her doctrine, rests on a perpetual equivocation and whilst allowing the English public to believe that when she spoke of the coming Christ she referred to the Christ of the Gospels, she stated to her intimates what Mr. Leadbeater taught in his book The Inner Life, namely, that the Christ of the Gospels never existed, but was an invention of the monks of the second century. It should be understood, however, that in the language of the Theosophists, led by Mrs. Besant and Mr. Leadbeater, Jesus and, the Christ, are two separate and distinct individualities, and that when they now speak of, the Christ, they refer to someone living in a bungalow in the Himalayas with whom Mr. Leadbeater has interviews to arrange about his approaching advent. Portraits of this person have been distributed amongst the members of, The Star in the East, an order founded at Ben Ayres in 1911 by Mr. Leadbeater and J. Krishnamurti for the purpose of preparing the world for the coming of the great teacher. But it is time to return to the alliance between Theosophy and the Mahonary mixed. Whether Mrs. Besant, who had begun her career as a free thinker, retained some lingering belief in her earlier creed at the time she entered into relations with the Order, or whether she saw in this materialistic society a valuable concrete organization for the dissemination of her new esoteric theories, it is impossible to know. At any rate, she rose rapidly through the succeeding degrees and became before long vice president of the Super Me Conceal, which appointed her its national delegate to Great Britain. It was in this capacity that she founded the English branch of the order under the name of Co-Masonry, that is, admitting both sexes, at the Lodge, Human Duty, in London, which was consecrated on September 26, 1902 and later founded another lodge at Adar in India, named, the Rising Sunday the number of lodges on the grand roll of co-masonry, including those abroad, is now said to be no less than 442. Co-masonry thus receives a two-fold direction, for whilst remaining in constant correspondence with the Supreme Conceal Universal Mixed, situated at five rue Jules Breton in Paris and presided over by the Grand Master Pion, with Madame Amlige Dalge, 33rd degree, as Grand Secretary General, it receives further instructions from the V. Hill, Bro, Annie Besant, 33 degree, at Adar. 
in order not to shock the susceptibilities of English adepts who might be repelled by the rationalist tendencies of the Ma Honorary Mixed, Mrs. Besant has, however, borrowed the formulas of British masonry together with its custom of placing the V.S. cell on the table in the lodges. These conflicting doctrines are blended in an amusing manner on the certificates of the order, where at the top we find the French motto and initials. Libet Gallet Fraternit. L. G. D. L. H. That is like Loire de l'Humanit and below, for the benefit of English members, the initials of the British Masonic device, that does not of course appear on the diplomas of the French order, which, like the Grand Orient, has rejected the great architect. T. T. G. O. T. G. A. O. T. U. To the glory of the great architect of the universe. Our Comasons therefore enjoy the advantage of being able to choose whether they shall render glory to God or to humanity. That the two devices are somewhat incompatible does not appear to strike the English initiates, nor do they probably realize the imposture practiced on them by the further wording of the certificate, which, after announcing in imposing capitals, to all Masons dispersed over both hemispheres, greeting, goes on to say, we therefore recommend him, or her, as such to all Freemasons of the globe, requesting them to recognize him, or her, in all the rights and privileges attached to this degree, as we will do to all presenting themselves under similar circumstances. Now, any British Mason will see at a glance that all this is a false pretension. No order of masonry can recommend its members for rights and privileges to, all the Freemasons of the world, for the simple reason that, as has been said, there is no such thing as, universal masonry, so that even Grand Lodge of England the most important lodge in the world could not, if it would, accord the right of entry for its members into continental lodges. As an English mason recently expressed it, the impression among non-Masons generally appears to be that a British or Irish member of the craft is able to enter a Masonic lodge in any part of the world and take part in its deliberations and proceedings. To this belief an unqualified denial may at once be given. Nor may a member of a lodge under any jurisdiction not in communion with the Grand Lodges of the United Kingdom be received as a visitor or as a joining member in any subsidiary lodge of the Grand Lodges of England, Ireland or Scotland. But for co-masonry to make this claim is even more ridiculous, since at the time when the above quoted diploma was drawn up co-masonry and its parent, the Ma Honorary Mixed, were not recognized by any other order of masonry except the Dwar Humane, and it is not only unrecognized but utterly repudiated by Grand Lodge of England. The British Mason, in fact, does not recognize the co-mason as a mason at all and would violate his obligations by discussing Masonic secrets with him or her, so that there is no manner in which the co-Mason could be accorded Masonic rights and privileges by British Masons. In order, further, to keep up the illusion in the minds of its members that they are genuine Masons, co-Masonry, in its quarterly organ, the co-Mason, is careful to include Masonic news relating to British Masonry as if it formed one and the same order, with regard to the Grand Orient, an equally tortuous policy was pursued. As we have already seen, the Grand Logie disgraced the lodge that had admitted Maria de Reisms and did not officially recognize the Ma Honorary Mixed. The ritual adopted by the latter order was, however, not that of British masonry, and in most co-Masonic lodges the ritual employed contains variations derived from the Grand Orient, Indeed the Grand Orient character of co-masonry has always been generally recognized in Masonic circles. This being so, I pointed out in World Revolution that co-masonry derives from the Grand Orient, but I received the following protest from a woman co-mason. Are you aware that for twenty years the Grand Orient has refused to recognize it, co-masonry, as a legitimate body, just as the English Orthodox Masons do now? Also, we are distinctly told before joining that we shall not be recognized by that body. Also, we have nothing to do with Illuminati, or with Germany. 
as the Grand Orient have eliminated the deity, it is rather a dreadful thing to a Mason to be connected in any way with that order, and I cannot imagine a worse thing could be said about us. This letter was dated March 6, 1922, and on the 19th of the preceding month of February an alliance between the Grand Orient and Co-Masonry had been finally celebrated at the Grand Temple of the Dois Humain in Paris. We find a report of this ceremony in the Co-Mason for the following April. It is evident, therefore, that members who were likely to be repelled by the idea of connection with the Grand Orient were assured that no such connection existed. But when this covert liaison developed into official recognition although this did not include the right of entry to the lodges of the Grand Orient for women members the triumphant manner in which the great event was announced in the Co-Mason suggests that the majority of members were likely to feel nothing but satisfaction at association with the order that had eliminated the deity. It is true that a few members protested and by this time Co-Masonry was too completely under the control of Mrs. Besant for any faction to question her dictates. Moreover, the opposition had been weakened by a schism which took place in the order in 1908, when a number of members who objected to the introduction of Eastern occultism into Masonry and likewise disapproved of the Grand Orient, formed themselves into a separate body under Mrs. Halsey and Dr. Geki Cobb working only the craft degrees according to the Grand Lodge of England. It has been shown by this brief our sum that co-masonry is a hybrid system deriving from two conflicting sources the political and rationalist doctrines of the Ma Honorary Mixed and the Eastern occultism of Madame Blavatsky and Mrs. Besant. As a professing Buddhist, Madame Blavatsky consistently dissociated herself from many schemes of material welfare. Thus in the early constitution of the Theosophical Society it is stated. The society repudiates all interference on its behalf with the governmental relations of any nation or community, confining its attention exclusively to the matters set forth in the present document. These matters relate to the study of occult sciences. Again Madame Blavatsky herself wrote in The Theosophist. Unconcerned about politics hostile to the insane dreams of socialism and communism, which it abhors as both are but disguised conspiracies of brutal force and selfishness against honest labor, the society cares but little about the outward human management of the material world. The whole of its aspirations are directed towards the occult truths of the visible and invisible worlds. It will be seen that this declaration is diametrically opposed to that of the Ma Honorary Mixed. Nevertheless, Madame Blavatsky so far departed from her purely occult program after her arrival in India in 1879 as to reconstruct the society on the basis of universal brotherhood. This idea was completely absent from her first scheme, the brotherhood plank in the society's future platform, wrote her co-adjutor Colonel Olcott, was not thought of. It was over this plank, however, that Mrs. Besant was able to walk to the Supreme Council of the Ma Honorary Mixed, and adding liberty and equality to the principle of fraternity to establish co-masonry on a definitely political basis as a preparation for the socialist doctrines her teacher had, abhorred. In the matter of esoteric doctrines Mrs. Besant again departed from the path laid down by Madame Blavatsky, whose aim had been to rehabilitate Buddhism in India representing the teachings of Gautama Buddha as an advance on Hinduism. Mrs. Besant, however, came to regard the doctrines of the Brahmins as the purer faith. Yet it was neither Buddhism nor Hinduism in a pure form that she introduced to the Khmasans of the West, but an occult system of her own devising, wherein Mahatmas, Swamis, and Gurus were incongruously mingled with the charlatans of 18th century France. Thus in the Co-Masonic Lodges we find, the King, inscribed over the Grand Master's chair in the East, in the North the empty chair of, the Master, to which, until recently, all members were required to bow in passing and over it a picture, veiled in some lodges, of the same mysterious personage. Should the neophyte inquire, who is the King? He may be told that he is the king who is to come from India whether he is identical with the young Hindu Krishnamurti adopted by Mrs. Besant in 1909 is not clear whilst the question, who is the master? 
will probably be met with the reply that he is, the master of all true Freemasons throughout the world, which the inquirer takes to mean the head of the religion to which he happens to belong Christ, Muhammad, or another. But in the third degree the astonishing information is confided with an appearance of great secrecy that he is no other than the famous Comte de Saint-Germain, who did not really die in 1784, but is still alive today in Hungary under the name of Rogowski. In yet a higher degree, however, the initiate may be told that the master is in reality Prince Eugene of Austria. It would be superfluous to describe in detail the wild nonsense that composes the creed of Co-Masonry, since a long series of articles was recently devoted to the subject in the Patriot and can be consulted by anyone who desires information concerning its ceremonies and the personnel directing it. Suffice it to say here that its course, like that of most secret societies, has been marked by violent dissensions amongst the members the Blavitskyites passionately denouncing the Besantites and the Besantites proclaiming the divine infallibility of their leader whilst at the same time scandals of a peculiarly unsavory kind have been brought to light. This fact has indeed created a serious schism in the ranks of the Theosophists, which shows that a number of perfectly harmless people are to be found amongst them. Yet the peculiar occurrence of such scandals in the history of secret societies leads one inevitably to wonder how far these are to be regarded as merely deplorable accidents or as the results of secret society methods and of occult teaching. That the men against whom charges of sexual perversion were brought were not isolated examples of these tendencies is shown by a curious admission on the part of one of Madame Blavitsky's, Sheila's, or disciples, who relates. I was a pupil of HPB. Before Mrs. Besant joined the TS. And saw her expel one of her most gifted and valued workers from the esoteric section for offenses against the occult and moral law, similar to those with which Mr. Leadbeater's name has now been associated for nearly twenty years. HPB. Was always extremely strict on this particular point, and many, my adults, would be aspirants for Chila ship were refused on this one ground alone, while others who had been accepted, on probation, failed almost immediately afterwards. It would appear, then, that these deplorable proclivities are peculiarly prevalent amongst aspirants to theosophical knowledge. It is unnecessary to enlarge at length on Mrs. Besant's connection with the seditious elements in this country and in India, since these have frequently been referred to in the press. It is true that the Theosophical Society, like the Grand Orient, disavows all political intentions and professes to work only for spiritual development, but the leaders appear to consider that a radical change must take place in the existing social system before true spiritual development can be attained. That this change would lie in the direction of socialism is suggested by the fact that a group of leading Theosophists, including Mrs. Besant, were discovered in 1919 to be holding a large number of shares in the Victoria House Printing Company, which was financing the Daily Herald at that date. Indeed, Mrs. Besant in her lectures on liberty, equality, fraternity, at the Queen's Hall in October of the same year, clearly indicated socialism as the system of the coming new era. Since then the Action Lodge has been founded with the object of carrying theosophical ideals and conceptions into all fields of human activity, from which the political field appears not to be excluded, since this lodge has been known to cooperate with the promoters of a political meeting on the Indian question. It is interesting to notice that a leading member of the Action Lodge, and also of the Order of the Star in the East, was recently reported in the press to have been long connected with the Labour Party and to have notified her intention of standing for it in Parliament. This is, of course, not to say that all Theosophists are Socialists. The Theosophical Society of America, in an admirable series of articles discussing the theory of world revolution set forth in my books, pointed out that the pupils of the powers of evil work untiringly to thwart every real advance of the human race, to pull down whatever civilization painfully builds, that makes for light and true development and spiritual growth. 
it would not be difficult to suggest reasons why these pupils and co-workers of the powers of darkness choose the chief clauses of their creed, internationalism, communism, the destruction of the higher class through the despotic rule of the lowest class, the corruption of family life. The attack on religion hardly needs comment. It will be seen, then, that socialism and internationalism are not an essential part of theosophical teaching, and that the more enlightened theosophists recognize the danger of these destructive doctrines. At a special convention in England on April 6 of this year, seven lodges entered a protest against recent departures from the original policy of the society. Amongst the resolutions put forward was one urging the president, Mrs. Besant, to establish a tribunal, to investigate matters affecting the good name of the society, and the conduct of certain members, this was lost by, an overwhelming majority. Another resolution regretted that, the administration, the magazine, and the influence of the society have been used for controversial political ends and sectarian religious propaganda. Unhappily these resolutions were not met in the fraternal spirit that might be expected from a society setting out to establish universal brotherhood and were stigmatized in a proposed amendment as, destructive motions. At variance with the objects for which the society stands. This clause in the amendment was lost by a small majority, but a very large majority supported the further clauses in which the special convention affirmed its complete confidence in the administration of the society and its beloved and revered president Dr. Annie Besant, the chosen leader of whom it is justly proud, and sent, its cordial greetings to Bishop Liebeter, FTS. Thanking him, for his invaluable work and his unswerving devotion to the cause of theosophy and the service of the Theosophical Society. There are, then, a certain number of theosophists in this country who have the courage and public spirit to protest against the use of the society for political ends and against infractions of the moral code which they believe certain members to have committed. But this party unfortunately constitutes only a small minority, the rest are prepared to render blind and unquestioning obedience to the dictates of Mrs. Besant and Mr. Leadbeater. In this respect the Theosophical Society follows the usual plan of secret societies. For although not nominally a secret society it is one in effect, being composed of outer and inner circles and absolutely controlled by supreme directors. The inner circle, known as the esoteric section, or rather the Eastern School of Theosophy usually referred to as the E.S. is in reality a secret society consisting in its turn of three further circles, the innermost composed of the Mahatmas or Masters of the White Lodge, the second of the accepted pupils or initiates, and the third of the learners or ordinary members. The E.S. and Co-Masonry thus composed two secret societies within the open order controlled by people who are frequently members of both. Whether even these higher initiates are really in the secret is another question. Dr. Weller Van Hook who is said to have been also a Rosicrucian and an important member of the Grand Orient once cryptically observed that, Theosophy is not the hierarchy, implying that it was only part of a world organization, and darkly hinting that if it did not carry out the work allotted to it, the Rosicrucians would take control. That this is more than probable we shall see later. The outer ranks of the Theosophical Society seem to be largely composed of harmless enthusiasts who imagine that they are receiving genuine instruction in the religions and occult doctrines of the East. That the teaching of the E.S. would not be taken seriously by any real Orientalist and that they could learn far more by studying the works of recognized authorities on these subjects at a university or at the British Museum does not occur to them for a moment. Nor would this fulfill the purpose of the leaders. For the Theosophical Society is not a study group, but essentially a propagandist society which aims at substituting for the pure and simple teaching of Christianity the amazing compound of Eastern superstition, Kabbalism, and 18th century charlatanism which Mrs. Besant and her co-adjutors have devised. Yet even were the doctrines of Mrs. Besant those of true Buddhism or of Brahmanism, to what extent are they likely to benefit Western civilization? Setting the question of Christianity aside, 
experience shows that the attempt to orientalize Occidentals may prove no less disastrous than the attempt to Occidentalize Orientals, and that to transport Eastern mysticism to the West is to vulgarize it and to produce a debased form of occultism that frequently ends in moral deterioration or mental derangement. I attribute the scandals that have taken place amongst theosophists directly to this cause. But it is time to turn to another society in which this debased occultism plays a still more important part. Rosicrucianism. At the present time, as in the 18th century, the term Rosicrucianism is used to cover a number of associations differing in their aims and doctrines. The first of these societies to be founded in England was the Societas Rosicruciana in Anglia, founded in 1867 by Robert Wentworth Little on instructions received from abroad. Only Master Masons are admitted a procedure not condemned by Grand Lodge of England, which regards the SRIA as a perfectly innocuous body. Although neither political nor anti Christian, but, on the contrary, containing distinctly Christian elements and claiming to descend from Christian Rosencrantz a claim which must be dismissed as an absurdity the SRIA is nevertheless largely Kabbalistic, dealing with the forces of nature, alchemy, etc. If its progenitors are really to be traced further back than the Rosicrucians of the 19th century Regan, Eliphaz Elvi, and Kenneth Mackenzie they must be sought amongst certain esoteric masons in Hungary and also amongst the French Martinists, whose rituals doubtless derived from a kindred source. It will be remembered that Marlene's Pasquale bequeathed to his disciples a large number of Jewish manuscripts which were presumably preserved in the archives of the Martinist Lodge at Lyon. The Order of Martinists has never ceased to exist, and the president of the Supermecan Seal, Dr. G. Radinkors, well known as Papus, an avowed Kabbalist, only died in 1916. To these archives another famous Kabbalist, the renegade Ab, Alphonse Louis Constant, who assumed the name of Eliphaz Elvi, may well have had access. It is said that one of Eliphaz Elvi's most distinguished disciples, the occultist Baron Spedaleri of Marseille, was a member of the Grand Lodge of Solidary Brethren of the Mountain, an illumined brother of the ancient restored order of Manichans, a high member of the Grand Orient, and also a high illuminate of the Martinists. Before his death in 1875 Eliphaz Elvi announced that in 1879 a new political and religious, universal kingdom, would be established, and that it would be possessed by, him who would have the keys of the East. The manuscript containing this prophecy was passed on by Baron Spedaleri to Edward Maitland, who in his turn gave it to a leading member of SRIA, by whom it was published in English. But, as we have already seen, the principal center of Kabbalism was in Eastern Europe, whilst Germany was the principal home of Rosicrucianism, and it was from these directions that, a few years later, a new Rosicrucian order in England derived its inspiration. It is curious to notice that the 80s of the last century were marked by a simultaneous recrudescence of secret societies and of socialist organizations. In 1880 Leopold Engel reorganized Wei Schorp's Order of Illuminati, which, according to M. Gunon, played thenceforth, an extremely suspect political ally, and soon after this in 1884 it is said that a strange incident took place in London. The Reverend A. F. A. Woodford, A. F. M. Happened to be turning over the contents of a second hand bookstall in Farringdon Street when he came upon some cipher MSS. Attached to which was a letter in German saying that if the finder were to communicate with Sapiens Domina Baterastris, C slash O Fräulein Anna Springle, in Germany, he would receive further interesting information. This, at any rate, is the story told to initiates of the order which came to be founded according to the instructions given in the cipher. But when we remember that precisely the same story was told by Galliastro concerning his discovery of a miss in London by the mysterious George Cofton on which he had founded his Egyptian rite, 
we begin to wonder whether the placing of a miss in a spot where it is certain to be discovered by precisely the people qualified to decipher it forms one of the traditional methods of secret society adepts for extending their sphere of influence without betraying their identity or revealing the center of direction. In this case it certainly succeeded admirably, for by a fortunate coincidence the clergyman who found the cipher MSS was acquainted with two prominent members of the SIRA. Dr. Wynne Westcott and Dr. Woodman, to whom he took the documents, and by a further fortunate coincidence one of them happened to be the very person to whom Eliphaz Elvi's prophecy had been given, these two men who now assumed the pseudonyms of S.A. Say Pierrot, and M.E.V. Magnusist Veritas, were able partially to decipher the manuscript, S.A with the assistance of a German, then wrote to S.D.A. C. O. Fräulein Anna Springle, saying that he and a friend had finished the deciphering and that they desired further information. In reply they were told to elaborate the notes, and that if diligent they would be allowed to form an elementary branch of the Rosicrucian order in England. Finally S.D.A. wrote to S.A. authorizing him to sign her, or his name to any warrant or document necessary for the constitution of an order, and promising later on further rituals and advanced teachings if the preliminary order proved successful. S.A. and M.E.V. now called in the aid of a third member of the S.I.R.A. McGregor Mathers, henceforth known as D.D.C.F. Deo Duce Kamite Ferro, who, having more time at his disposal, was able by means of long and arduous labor, to elaborate the rituals in Masonic style. On March 8, 1888, a warrant was then drawn up according to the design given in the cipher MSS. And was signed by S.A. for S.D.A. by M.E.V. and D.D.C.F. All three having received the honorary grade of 7 to 4 from S.D.A. so as to enable them to act as chief of the new temple. It is interesting to note that whilst the instructions in the cipher MSS were in English and German, the name now given to the new order, the Golden Dawn, was accompanied by its equivalent in Hebrew, Chebrath Zirich or Boka, that is to say, the companions of the rising light of the morning. Amongst the instructions we find, avoid Roman Catholics but with pity, also these directions concerning the obligation. The candidate asking for light is taken to the altar and forced to take an obligation to secrecy under penalty of expulsion and death or palsy from hostile current of will. From the subsequent correspondence of the order it is seen that this so-called, punitive current, was actually directed by the chiefs against those who rebelled. Although the members of the Golden Dawn later became linked up with the esoteric masons, in Germany, Neither the organization nor the ritual of the order are Masonic, but rather Martinist and Kabbalistic. For amidst all the confused phraseology of the order, the phrases and symbols borrowed from Egyptian, Greek, or Hindu mythology, one detects the real basis of the whole system the Jewish Kabbalah, in which all the three chiefs were, or became, experts. Mathers in fact translated the famous book of Abraham the Jew from French into English with explanatory notes, and when Westcott translated the Sefer Yetzirah from Hebrew. Lectures were given to the society on such subjects as the tarot cards, geomantic talismans, and the Scamamparas Cortetaragrammaton. The order was at first absolutely governed by the three chiefs, but after a time owing to the death of Woodman and the resignation of Wynne West Cut Mathers became the sole chief and professed to have obtained further instructions from the hidden chiefs through his wife a sister of Bergson by means of clairvoyance and clairaudience. But the real directors of the order were in Germany and known as the hidden and secret chiefs of the third order. A curious resemblance will here be noted with the concealed superiors by whom members of the strict observance in the 18th century declared themselves to be controlled. Who these men were at the time the order was founded remains a mystery not only to the outside world but even to the English initiates themselves. 
the identity of Sapiens Domina Baterastris appears never to have been established, nor was anything more heard about the still more mysterious Anna Springle until her death in an obscure German village was reported in 1893. Indeed, one of the most active members of the order, Dr. Robert Felkin, M.D., known as F.R. Fine M. Respis, later declared that, although he had visited five temples of the order in Germany and Austria, he had been unable to get into touch with the hidden chiefs, or to discover how the original MSS came into the hands of the clergyman who handed them to Win Westcott and Woodman. According to Felkin's statement, all that he had been able to find out was that the MSS were the notes of ceremonies made by a man who had been initiated into a lodge in Germany, and that the temple from which they originated was a special temple working on the Kabbalah tree like the English branch of the order. Further, he was told that none of the big three who founded the Golden Dawn in England were real Rosicrucians at all. The confusion of ideas which must inevitably result when, as in secret societies or revolutionary organizations, a number of people are being blindly led by hidden directors, naturally brought about dissensions amongst the members who mutually accused each other of ignorance of the real aims of the order. Thus the London Lodge ended by breaking with Mathers, who was in Paris, on account of his arrogance in claiming supreme power through the mystery of the hidden chiefs, and after two years of unsettled government, in 1902 elected three new chiefs Dr. Felkin, Fr. equals Fine M. Respis, Bullock, a solicitor, L.O. equals Lavavi Oculos, who resigned at the end of the year, and Brody Innes, S.S. Subsp. But although Mathers had been repudiated, his teachings were retained as emanating from the hidden chiefs. Two years earlier a dramatic incident had occurred. In a very sinister personage, Aleister Crowley, had been introduced into the order on the recommendation of A. E. Wait, S. R. equals Sacramentum Regis the well-known mystical writer. A man of many aliases, Crowley followed the precedent of the Comte de Saint-Germain, the Comte de Cagliostro, and the Baron von Oftenbach, by enabling himself and masquerading under various titles in turn, such as, Counts Verif, Lord Bolskin, Baron Rosenkrutz, but usually known in the order as P4, Pert Jurobo. Crowley, who was a Kabbalist, had written a book on Gdic magic and soon after becoming a member of the Golden Dawn, set to work with another frater on magical experiments, including evocations, the consecration and use of talismans, divination, alchemy, etc. In 1900 Crowley had joined Mathers in Paris where the latter and his wife were living under the assumed names of the Comte and Comtesse of Glenstre, and engaged in reviving the mysteries of Isis at the Bodinieri Theatre. In this task they were joined by an extraordinary lady, the notorious Madame Horrors, alias the Swami, who claimed to be the real and authentic Sapiens Domina Baterastris. Crowley described her as, a very stout woman and very fair, and, a vampire of remarkable power, Mathers declared her to be, probably the most powerful medium living, but later, in a letter to another member of the, Golden Dawn, observed. I believe her and her accomplices to be emissaries of a very powerful secret occult order who have been trying for years to break up other orders and especially my work. Incidentally this lady, who proved to be a false SDA, ended by starting an order in collaboration with her husband, in which it was said that certain rituals of the Golden Dawn were adapted to an immoral purpose with the result that the couple were brought to trial and finally condemned to penal servitude. Whether owing to this disturbing experience, or because, as Crowley declared, he had, imprudently attracted to himself forces of evil too great and terrible for him to withstand, presumably abrimaline demons, Mather's reason began to totter. This then was the situation at the time of his rupture with the order, and the dramatic incident referred to was the sudden appearance of Crowley in London, who, whether acting as Mather's envoy or on his own initiative, broke into the premises of the order, with a black mask over his face, a plaid shawl thrown over his shoulders, an enormous gold, or gilt, cross on his breast, 
and a dagger at his side, for the purpose of taking over possession. This attempt was baffled with the prosaic aid of the police and Crowley was expelled from the order. Eventually, however, he succeeded in obtaining possession of some of the rituals and other documents of the Golden Dawn, which he proceeded to publish in the organ of a new order of his own. This magazine, containing a mixture of debased Kabbalism and vulgar blasphemies, interspersed with panegyrics on Haskish for Crowley combined with sexual perversion and addiction to drugs which might appear to express only the ravings of a maniac. But eccentricity has often provided the best cloak for dark designs, and the outbreak of war proved that there was a method in the madness of the man whom the authorities persisted in regarding merely as an irresponsible degenerate of a non-political kind. To quote the press report of his exploits after this date, in November 1914 Crowley went to the United States, where he entered into close relations with the pro-German propagandists. He edited the New York International, a German propagandist paper run by the notorious George Sylvester Vierek, and published, among other things, an obscene attack on the king and the glorification of the Kaiser. Crowley ran occultism as a sideline, and seems to have been known as the Purple Priest. Later on he publicly destroyed his British passport before the Statute of Liberty, declared in favor of the Irish Republican cause, and made a theatrical declaration of war on England. During his stay in America Crowley was associated with a body known as the Secret Revolutionary Committee, which was working for the establishment of an Irish Republic. He is known also as the writer of a defeatist manifesto circulated in France in 1915. But to return to the Golden Dawn. In 1903 a split occurred in the order. A.E. Wait, an early member of it, seceded from it with a number of other members and carried off with him the name of, Golden Dawn, also the vault and other property of the order. The original order then took the name of, Stella Matutina, with Dr. Falcon as chief. In the preceding year the members of the London Lodge had again believed that they were in touch with the Hidden Third Order and revived their efforts to communicate with the secret chiefs in Germany. This state of uncertainty continued till about 1910, when Falkin and Meekin set forth for Germany, where they succeeded in meeting several members of the Third Order, who professed to be, true and genuine Rosicrucians and to know of Anna Springle and the starting of the order in England. They were not, it was believed, the secret and hidden chiefs, but more probably esoteric masons of the Grand Orient. These fratters, however, told them that in order to form a definite etheric link between themselves and the order in Great Britain, it would be necessary for a British fratter to be under their instruction for a year. Accordingly Meekin remained in Germany for special training so that he might act as the etheric link between the two countries. After a pilgrimage to the Near East, closely following the itinerary of Christian Rosencrantz, Meekin returned to Germany, and it appears to have been now that he was able to get into touch with a certain high adept of occult science. This remarkable personage, Rudolf Steiner, had earlier belonged to the Theosophical Society and it has been suggested that at some period he may have been connected with the revived Illuminati of Leopold Engel. There is certainly some reason to believe that at one point in his career he came into touch with men who were carrying on the teachings of Wei I Schorpt, the chief of whom was the president of a group of pan-German secret societies, and it seems not improbable that the mysterious SDA, under whose directions the Golden Dawn was founded, might be located in this circle. A few years before the war, Steiner, whilst still a theosophist, started a society of his own, the Anthroposophical Society, a name borrowed from the work of the 17th century Rosicrucian, Thomas Vaughan, Anthroposophica Magica. The ostensible leader of Rosicrucianism in Germany was Dr. Franz Hartmann, founder of the Order of the Esoteric Rosekreuz. Although in some way connected with Engel's Illuminati and more definitely with the Theosophical Society, Hartmann was believed to be a genuine Christian mystic. Steiner also made the same profession, and it seems probable that he formed one of the group of mysterious personages, 
including besides Grand Orient Masons, Baron von Nitsch, great grandson of Weyarshaupt's coadjutor, Philo, who met together in secret conference at Ingoldstadt where the first lodge of the Illuminati had been founded in 1776, and decided to revive Illuminism on Christian mystic lines used in a very elastic sense amongst occultists. At the same time Steiner introduces into his teaching a strong vein of Gnosticism, Luciferianism, Johannism, and Grand Orient Masonry, whilst reserving Rosicrucianism for his higher initiates. On this last point he is extremely reticent, preferring to call his teaching, occult science, since he recognizes that, real Rosicrucians never proclaim themselves as such, it is therefore only in the inner circle of his society, on which no information is given to the public and into which members are admitted by much the same forms of initiation as those used by the Grand Orient, that Rosicrucianism is mentioned. Some of Steiner's imitators in the Rosicrucian Fellowship at Oceanside, California, however, openly profess what they call Rosicrucianism and at the same time claim superior knowledge on the subject of Masonry. Thus in a book by the leader of this group we find it solemnly stated that according to Max Heindel, Eve cohabited with serpents in the Garden of Eden, that Cain was the offspring of her union with, the Lucifer spirits a male, and that from this, divine progenitor, the most virile portion of the human race descended, the rest being merely the, progeny of human parents. Readers of the present work will recognize this as not the legend of masonry but of the Jewish Kabbalah which has been already quoted in this context. Whether this also forms part of Steiner's teaching it is impossible to say, since his real doctrines are known only to his inner circle, even some of his admirers amongst the Steiner Matutina, whilst consulting him as an oracle are not admitted to the secrets of his grades of initiation and have been unable to succeed in obtaining from him a charter. Meanwhile they themselves do not disclose to the neophytes whom they seek to win over that they are members of any secret association. This is quite in accordance with the methods of Wei Ishorpts, insinuating brothers. The result of what Steiner calls, occult science, is thus described in a striking passage of one of his own works. This is the change which the occult student observes coming over himself that there is no longer a connection between a thought and a feeling or a feeling and a volition, except when he creates the connection himself. No impulse drives him from thought to action if he does not voluntarily harbor it. He can now stand completely without feeling before an object which, before his training, would have filled him with glowing love or violent hatred. He can likewise remain actionless before a thought which heretofore would have spurred him to action as if by itself, etc. I can imagine no clear eye expose of the dangers of occultism in this. Where I shopped had said, I cannot use men as I find them, I must form them. Dr. Steiner shows how this transformation can be accomplished. Under the influence of so-called occult training, which is in reality simply powerful suggestion, all a man's native impulses and inhibitive springs of action may be no broken, the pupil of the occultist will no longer react to the conceptions of beauty or ugliness, of right or wrong, which, unknown to himself, form the law of his being. Thus not only his conscious deeds but his subconscious processes pass under the control of another. If this is indeed the method employed by Dr. Steiner and his adepts there would certainly seem to be some justification for the verdict of M. Robert quaints that, Steiner has devised occult exercises which rendered the mind incapable, rendered less pertinenti, that he attacks the individual by deranging his faculties, il detracle facultes. What is the real motive power behind such societies as the Stella Matutina and again behind Steiner? This remains a mystery, not only to the outside world but to the initiates themselves. The quest of the hidden chiefs, undertaken by one intrepid pilgrim after another, seems to have ended only in further meetings with Steiner. Yet hope springs eternal in the breast of the aspirant after occult knowledge, and astral messages spurred the fratters to further efforts. One of these contained the exhortation, Go on with Steiner which is not the ultimate end of search, 
and we will come into contact with many serious students who will lead us to the real master of the order, who will be so overpoweringly impressive as to leave no room for doubt. A curious analogy with co-masonry will here be observed. For whilst the veiled picture of the co-masonic lodges is said to represent, the master, in the person of Rogowski or some other personage in Austria or Hungary, so it is likewise in Austria and Germany that the members of Stella Matutina seek their hidden chiefs and the, real master, of their order. Moreover, whilst the Co-Masons await the coming of the great, world teacher, king, or messiah in 1926, it is also in 1926 that the Stella Matutina expect Christian Rosencrantz to appear again. There are many other points of resemblance between the phraseology of the two orders, as, for example, the idea of the, astral light, the great white lodge, and also, the great work, by which both orders denote the supreme object of their aspirations, the union of the East and the West. It is therefore impossible not to suspect that, although the members of co-masonry and of the Stella Matutina imagine their respective orders to be entirely unconnected and indeed appear to be hardly aware of each other's existence, there may be nevertheless some point of junction in the background and even a common center of direction. In this connection it is interesting to notice the political tendencies of the societies in question. Although the outcome of the Ma Honorary mixed, and nominally under the jurisdiction of headquarters in Paris, Co-masonry does not appear to be pro-French in its sympathies. On the contrary, the Co-Masonic lodges in this country, as also the head lodge in the Rue Jules Breton, seem to have adopted that form of universal brotherhood which principally redounds to the benefit of Germany. The Stella Matutina, whilst professing to be solely concerned in occult science and warning its members against Co-masonry on account of the political tendencies of the latter, is nevertheless still more imbued with German influence, since, as we have seen, it has ever since it first came into existence been secretly under Germany direction. Indeed, during the war this influence became so apparent that certain patriotic members, who had entered the society in all good faith with the idea of studying occult science, raised an energetic protest and a schism took place. Thus, just as in the case of Co-Masonry, the more clear-sighted recognized the imprudence of placing themselves under foreign control. That this was no imaginary danger is shown by a correspondence which had taken place some years earlier and has recently been brought to light. It will be remembered that the great aim of Weyerschacht and the Illuminati of the 18th century was to obtain control over all existing Masonic and occult orders, this also became the dream of Rudolf Steiner and his allies in other countries, whose plan was to form what they called an, International Bund. The idea of an International Bureau for Masonic Affairs had already, as we have seen, been started in Switzerland, this was the same idea applied to occult groups, so that all such societies as Rosicrucianism, Theosophy with its various ramifications of Co-Masonry, etc. Hermetic Orders, isolated occultists, and so on, were to be placed under German control. The audacity of the proposal seems to have been too much even for some of the most internationally minded members of the Stella Matutina, and in the discussion that took place it was pointed out that admirable as the scheme might be, there was nevertheless some British spirit amongst these orders to be reckoned with. Even Mrs. Besant's followers, headed by the Co-Masons, described as a group which, attracts a large number of idle women who have leisure to take a little occultism with their afternoon tea, might be liable to ask, who are these Germans to interfere? But the real obstacle to success was held to be British Freemasonry, to which a certain number of students of occult science, including all the members of the SRIA, belonged, English Masonry, it was remarked, boasts the Grand Lodge of 1717, the mother lodge of the world. They are a proud, jealous, autocratic body. Co-masonry derives from the Grand Orient of France, an illegitimate body according to English ruling. No English mason can work with co-masons. If the English Grand Lodge hears of anything called esoteric masonry derived from such sources, under chiefs once T.S. 
Theosophical Society, members, under a head in Berlin, it will not inquire who Dr. Steiner is or what is the nature of his work, it will simply say, no English Masons of the free and accepted Masons may join any society working pseudo-Masonic rites, that is no one of ordinary accepted Freemasonry can attend any meetings or attend any grades in this illegitimate body. Finness. If a lodge of the Continental Order is to be established in England, Dr. Steiner will be faced with the Masonic difficulty. This is really serious. Here then is one of the finest tributes ever paid to British Masonry, for it shows that as at present constituted and controlled it provides the most formidable barrier against the infiltration of this country by alien or subversive secret societies. Thus the Freemasons and the Roman Catholics are recognized as the principal obstacles to success. The Freemasons, however, would do well to realize the attempts that are made to break down this resistance by traitors in the Masonic camp, who, after violating their obligations by belonging to an irregular secret society, act as recruiting agents in the lodges. For the author of these remarks was a British Freemason who, in collusion with a foreign adept, proposed to penetrate Freemasonry by the process known in revolutionary language as, boring from within. To quote his own words, they must be got at from within, not from without. This was to be accomplished in various ways by adepts of the Continental Order getting themselves initiated into Orthodox Masonry and then spreading their own doctrines in the lodges or by enlisting recruits amongst Orthodox Masons and using them as propagandists among their brother Masons. It was also suggested that in order not to rouse suspicion it would be better to avoid the name, Esoteric Masonry, to adopt one of the rituals used in England, and to employ as officers a, mixed group, drawn from various secret societies. This plan has been carried out with considerable success and at a recent conference held by a high continental adept under the most distinguished patronage, it was interesting to notice the various secret societies represented by certain of the promoters, who of course to the general public appeared to be merely isolated individuals interested in philosophical speculation. But it is time to pass on to the question of yet another secret association, for amongst those present at the conference referred to were members of the group Clart. This society, of which the name as well as its avowed aims are singularly reminiscent of Illuminism, was first heard of in France and was led by men who carried on active anti-patriotic propaganda throughout the war. Amongst these was Henri Barbus, author of Le Fair, a defeatist novel which was received with acclamations from illuminated reviewers in the press of this country. Yet although outwardly a French organization, the real inspiration and teaching of Clart is essentially German Jewish and a great number of Jews are to be found amongst its members, particularly in Central Europe. At the inaugural meeting of the Austrian group it was stated that 80% of those present were of the Jewish race. The keynote of Clart is internationalism abolition of nationality, destruction of frontiers and pacifism or rather the substitution of class warfare for war between nations. For this purpose it is willing to make use of all subversive doctrines, to whatever school of thought they may belong. Hence, although the creed of the leaders is professedly socialism, they readily cooperate with syndicalists, anarchists, or revolutionaries of any brand, carrying on propaganda in trade unions and various workers' organizations, some are secretly in the ranks of the communists. In fact members of Chart have succeeded in penetrating into almost every subversive group, even as far afield as New Zealand, where the society has an agency in Wellington and disseminates the most violent revolutionary teaching and literature. But whilst thus making use of the proletariat to further its ends, the point of view of Clart is fundamentally undemocratic for the real grievances of the workers it has no use at all. The plan of this group who were recently described in the French press as, the finest specimens of cannibals smeared with humanitarianism, les plus beaux specimens de cannabis barbu il est humanitaire, is to constitute a sort of international hierarchy of intellectual socialists, whose influence is to make itself invisibly felt in literary, educational, and artistic circles all over the world. 
for the members of Clart are as careful as were the adepts of Wei Ashok to preserve their incognito and not to be known as Illuminati. Thus the public in our own country and elsewhere, reading the diatribes of certain well-known authors against the existing order of society, may vaguely wonder why men living amidst all the amenities of civilization should desire its destruction, but do not dream that all this is not the outcome of an individual brain but propaganda put out by a company which, having largely primed such writers with ideas, is able owing to the high position of many of its leading members and its influence with the literary world, to ensure the success of any publication that will further its ends. The organization of class thus approximates more nearly, to the system of way I shopped than that of the other societies described in this chapter. Although in the strictest sense a secret society, it is in no sense a cult and therefore possesses no ritual of its own, but, like the earlier Illuminati, recognizes the utility of working through Freemasonry. Clart, in fact, forms an adjunct of the Grand Orient and owns a lodge under its jurisdiction in Paris. It would be interesting, however, to know whether the idea of the alliance with the Grand Orient occurred as an afterthought to the Clart group or whether the original inspiration of Clart emanated from an inner circle of the Grand Orient. We shall return to the question of this inner circle in a later chapter. Such then, are the principal secret societies at work in Great Britain, but amongst minor secret or semi-secret movements may be mentioned the strange sect the Fatists, said to have some affinity with the Druzes, inhabiting a singularly unromantic London suburb, whose, ancient founder, is the author of a series of tracts urging man not to be misled by false gods, but to worship, Jehovah her creator only, and at the same time advocating nationalization as a cure for all social ills, or again the Institute for the Harmonious Development of Man at Fontainebleau, led by Gurdjieff and Duspensky which combines esoteric meditation with an extremely meager diet and strenuous manual labor. It is interesting, by the way, to notice that the art of movement known as Yerdham is not to be confounded with the system of M. Dalcrows which is known in England only as Yerdmix forms an important part of the curriculum of the last society, as also of Herrsteiner's order, of the Stella Matutina, and of the Russian Bolsheviks. The one question that presents itself to the judicial mind after examining all these movements, is inevitably, are they of any real importance? Can a few hundreds, or even thousands, of men and women, drawn largely by curiosity or want of occupation into societies of which the very names are hardly known to the general public, exercise any influence on the world at large. It would certainly be an error to overestimate the power that each of these societies individually can wield, to do so would be, in fact, to play into the hands of the leaders, whose plan, from way I shopped onwards, has always been to represent themselves as directing the destinies of the universe. This claim to power is the bait laid for neophytes, who are made to believe that, the order will one day rule the world. But, whilst recognizing the folly of this pretension, we should be mistaken in underrating their importance, for the reason that they provide evidence of a larger organization in the background. The Stella Matutina may be only an obscure fraternity, even the Theosophical Society with all its ramifications may not be of great importance in itself, but will anyone with a knowledge of European affairs seriously maintain that the Grand Orient is a small or unimportant organization? And have we not seen that investigations into the smaller secret societies frequently lead back to this great Masonic power? Secret societies are of importance, because they are, moreover, symptomatic, and also because, although the work actually carried out in their lodges or councils may be of a trivial character, they are able by the power of association and the collective force they generate to influence public opinion and to float ideas in the outside world which may have far-reaching consequences. At any rate, the fact that they exist finally disposes of the contention that secret societies of a subversive and even of an abominable kind are things of the past. These amazing cults these strange perverted rites which we associate with the Dark Ages, are going on around us today. Illuminism, 
Kabbalism, and even Satanism are still realities. In 1908 Monsieur Cope in Albansley stated that circumstances had afforded him the proof that certain Masonic societies exist which are satanic, not in the sense that the devil comes to preside at their meetings, as that romancer of Iliotaxil pretended, but in that their initiates profess the cult of Lucifer. They adore him as the true God, and they are animated by an implacable hatred against the Christian God, whom they declare to be an imposter. They have a formula which sums up their state of mind, it is no longer, to the glory of the great architect of the universe, as in the Toloa Masonries, it is G, E, A, A, L, H, 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 A, D, M, 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 which means, Glaretamur Lucifer. Pain. Pain pain. And ye are maudit. Maudit. Maudit, glory and love for Lucifer. Hatred. 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 To God, accursed, accursed, accursed. It is professed in these societies that all that the Christian God commands is disagreeable to Lucifer, that all that he forbids is, on the contrary, agreeable to Lucifer that in consequence one must do all that the Christian God forbids and that one must shun like fire all that he commands. I repeat that with regard to all that, I have the proofs under my hand. I have read and studied hundreds of documents relating to one of these societies, documents that I have not permission to publish and which emanate from the members, men and women, of the group in question. I do not say that any society in England consciously practices this cult of Satan, but I too have seen dozens of documents relating to occult groups in this country which practice rites and evocations that lead to illness, moral perversion, mental derangement, and even in some cases to death. I have heard from the lips of initiates themselves accounts of the terrible experiences through which they have passed some have even urged me to bring the matter before the attention of the authorities. But unfortunately no department exists for the investigation of subversive movements. Yet since all these movements are intimately connected with revolutionary agitation they are well worth the attention of governments that desire to protect law, order, and public morality. The fact is that the very extravagance of their doctrines and practices seems to ensure their immunity. Nevertheless, whether the power at work behind them is of the kind we are accustomed to call, supernatural, or whether it is merely the outcome of the human mind, there can be no doubt of its potency for evil and of its very definite effects in the obliteration of all sense of truth and in sexual perversion. In the opinion of an initiate who belonged for years to the Stella Matutina, the dynamic force employed known as Kundalini is simply an electromagnetic force, of which the sex force is a part on which the adepts know how to play, and, the unseen hand behind all the seeming spiritism of these orders is a system of very subtle and cunning hypnotism and suggestion. Further, the aim of this group like that of all subversive esoteric orders, is, by means of such processes as eurythmics, meditations, symbols, ceremonies, and formulas, to awaken this force and produce false illumination for the purpose of obtaining spiritual seership, which is at most clairvoyance, clairaudience, etc. The ceremonies of the order are hypnotic, and by suggestion create the necessary mental and astral atmosphere, hypnotize and prepare the members to be the willing tools in the hands of the controlling adepts. The same initiate has communicated to me the following conclusions concerning the group in question, with the permission to quote them verbatim. I have been convinced that we, as an order, I have come under the power of some very evil occult order, profoundly versed in science both occult and otherwise, though not infallible, their methods being black magic, that is to say, electromagnetic power, hypnotism, and powerful suggestion. We are convinced that the order is being controlled by some sun order after the nature of the Illuminati, if not by that order itself. The reason why they, the leaders of all such orders, insisted so much upon the church and sacrament, especially before the initiation, is, I think, for the same reason as the use of the consecrated host in black magic. 
The Christian consecration and the use of the sacraments renders the building or person more powerful as a material basis for black magic even as in white magic, for the great good or the great evil. When the initiation is accomplished and the domination of the person complete, there is no further need for church or sacrament. We are told at the initiation, there is nothing incompatible with your civil, moral, or religious duties in this obligation. We now are convinced that this order is contrary absolutely to our civil, moral, and religious duties, which being so, our obligations are null and void. We are told that all that has taken place in Russia and elsewhere is due to these international occult forces set in motion by subversive esoteric lodges. Yet it is known that we have several branches of these same esoteric Masonic lodges carrying on their deadly work in our midst. England, as well as Europe, seems to be drifting along in a hypnotic sleep, and even our soundest politicians seem paralyzed and all that they attempt is turned to foolishness. Is there no one in authority who understands these things and realizes the danger both to the country and to individuals from these forces working for disruption and world revolution? How in the face of these declarations, coming from those inside the movement, can anyone maintain that Illuminism is dead and that secret societies present no danger to Christian civilization?